Hello, I'm going to talk about the gospel of hope that we have as believers in Jesus, that is Galatians 5.22, and whereas the gifts of the Spirit, such as wisdom, healing and so on, often come all at once, or maybe out of the blue, the fruit matures and grows over a long time. And note that these are the fruits of the Spirit, not the fruits of our own efforts. In fact, my own attempts at becoming more loving, peaceful, patient, etc., are not exactly successful, like rather like one small wizened raisin. And the picture coming up shows something of the wonderful harvest of the alternative of these fruits that God wants to produce in our lives. And what we're looking at are God's own qualities. And the problem is that we often have our own ideas of what each of the qualities means, which can get in the way of what God actually wants to give us. So as we look at each of these characteristics of the fruits of the Spirit, and I say a little about what each may mean, you might like to be quietly reflecting on what each characteristic means to you. So let's go down the list, starting with the most important one, love, which really encompasses all the others. And this love, God's love, agape love, is sacrificial and unconditional. If you love like this, you will probably be hurt because love continues whatever the wounds of rejection, control, abuse, and so on. Now, though this talk is intended for Mother's Day, I'm not sure when it's actually going to go out. It might still be on Mother's Day. So it's a good time to remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was one of the only two people who stood with Jesus at the cross as he died. And what strength she had and what pain she must have gone through, that is love. Joy. Not really happiness, but I think more a deep contentment which continues whatever happens to us. And Nehemiah 8.10 reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength and how we need this at this time. A peace, not just the absence of war, but the deep shalom peace which passes all understanding and which defends us against whatever life hurls at us. <clears throat> In particular, and it can defend us against the current fear which seems in danger of swamping not only our country but all the other countries with this pandemic. Patience. God is patient, long-suffering with our sin, our selfishness, and our independence. And 1 Timothy 1.16 tells us that God has unlimited patience. My goodness me. Interesting, too, that the root meaning of this word has to do with enduring suffering. Gentleness. Infinite care. A state of being which nurtures a budding plant, for instance. And Isaiah 42, 3 tells us that a bruised reed God will not break. He is gentle with us. Kindness, that is acts carried out arising from a gentle nature. The kindness of God, I think, led us to live by the sea in Ringmore, uh, something that we've longed to do for years, to live by the coast. And it was his kindness, knowing how much we'd love it, that led us here. Goodness, a state of perfection, I think. And in Genesis 1, remember that God, after creating each part of the universe, saw that it was good, and indeed at the end, that it was very good. In other words, it was uncorrupted, perfect order, and perfect harmony, and completely opposite to the chaos which is evil. Faithfulness. Never does God turn from you. He is the rock. 
He is always watching over you. His care never falters. And self-control sounds a bit different from the rest of all the others, but I think the context of this passage, which has been talking about sin, the sinful nature, makes it clear that this is control over evil desires. We were made, as we all know, of course, with free will, and we need to exercise it like a muscle. Our souls are made up of our minds, emotions and will. And above all, at the moment, I think we need to exercise our God-given control over anxiety and fear. It's a bit uncomfortable to read in Luke 21 that Jesus includes anxiety among a list of sins such as dissipation and drunkenness. And self-control helps us to gain authority over this. Now, we're going to look at some possible blocks on the screen. Um, and here is a site of the sheep blocking the road, which may not be common if you're a town dweller in the middle of Kingsbridge, but I promise you this can happen in Ringmore, usually on a boiling hot day when I'm half an hour late for where I want to go. Um, some of these blocks are, for instance, that we may believe a lie as truth. I'm not worthy. I'm not worth helping. Nothing good can ever happen to me. And these are lies from the enemy, not from God. Unforgiveness can be a block to receiving the fruits of the Spirit. And unforgiveness, again, is a will choice. Unresolved loss and bereavement can also sometimes get in the way. And also, I think, rejecting the uncomfortable parts of God's Word, such as those parts of the Bible which relate to gender and lifestyle and which, if we voice them, might make us unpopular and ridiculed and being accused of being intolerant. Smith Wigglesworth, the um, wonderful evangelist and missionary, said that if the belief in the whole Word of God could come together in the church with those who believe in the power of the Spirit, there would be an absolute explosion within the church of power and strength. Other things which might be a block, the sin of others, such as rejection and hurt, or our own sin. And if you are struggling with any of these, um, just a reminder that we have a prayer ministry team in the church who, once things get back to normal, would love to help you, to spend time with you, for you to discuss and to pray through any of these things, if, if you'd like that help. And as we move through these extraordinary times of coping with the coronavirus, we desperately need these fruits in our lives to keep us anchored to the only rock on which we can rely. I was wondering whether I should have given a talk like this and then I had a dream the other night. I, I was in our kitchen and I opened a cupboard door to find that the plates which we normally st stack there uh, were all pushed to the back of the cupboard and broken and in the front of the shelf was a pile of new orange, red, yellow, golden plates and as I opened the door these plates flew off in all directions. Really strange dream. But um, I think that God said to me that the, these lovely new plates represent the fruits of the Spirit. And we need to believe in them, of course, believe that they exist. But more than that, uh, we need to appropriate them into our lives so that we can stay anchored to the only rock on which we can really believe. And, and the more we allow God to build, to mature these fruits in our lives, rather than struggling to do them ourselves, the more I think we'll be able to bring love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, into the lives of other people around us. I think we are really called to do this at this time. 
So I'd like to end with a word of encouragement for those who feel they are struggling on their own. This is taken from a book by Gerald May called The Dark Night of the Soul. And what he says is this, often the only way for the most part of your life that God can work in your soul is that he has to do it in secret. That God gave you any sense of what he is doing or achieving, changing you or loving you, you would probably try to stop it or engineer it or take control of it. We are all such control freaks that God sometimes, if not often, has to operate in darkness. You may just feel it's another stupid day. And just a reminder at the end that God is constantly watching over all of us. What matters is not so much that you know God, but that God knows you. You're engraved on the palm of his hands. You are never out of his mind. There is not a moment when his eye is off you or his attention is distracted from you. No moment when his care falters. What unspeakable comfort. God is constantly watching over us. In our loneliness, maybe in our isolation, there is a thought to reassure God is constantly watching over us. Be blessed.